Hello and welcome to season four, episode 11 of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. For one last time, I am your host, Melissa Whitecross, coming to you live from Johannesburg. We have over 135 episodes recorded and available on YouTube. So if you miss out because of load shedding or your Tuesday nights have gotten busy, never fear, you can always catch up later. Tonight, we will finally have Nicholas Pattinson sharing his PhD research on the yellow-billed hornbills of the Kalahari and the challenges that they face with increasing temperatures. Nicholas Pattinson completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Pretoria, doing his honours degree under the supervision of Professor Andrew McKechnie and Dr. Susie Cunningham on the behaviour of birds in the Sonoran, Gascoigne, well, you'll have to help me with the pronunciation there, Nick, and Kalahari deserts. He went on to complete a master's at Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth under the supervision of Dr. Ben Smith on the physiology and behavior of the Rufus Ed Warbler. Continuing from there, Nick reunited with Susie and Andrew for a PhD in biological sciences at the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology on Southern yellow-billed hornbills. He started his PhD in 2018 and will undoubtedly finish it some point this year. And it sounds like it's getting rather close. So good luck with the last push, Nick. Over the last year, Nick has joined an environmental firm called Ground Truth, where he is working full-time as a research scientist. Nick is an enthusiastic ecologist, environmentalist, and conservationist. I'd like to welcome you onto the show, Nick, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. You can switch on your video and take us away. Excellent. Thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, just make sure you can see that okay. Looking good. Thanks, Nick. Excellent. Uh, and I'll put my video on as well. There we go. Good luck. Um, awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for the uh, introduction, Melissa. Um, and well, uh, a, a privilege and a, and a sad honor, I suppose, to be um, the person speaking for your very last con conservation conversation that you're hosting. Um, but yeah, what a terrific job you've done over three years. And um, yeah, thanks again for, for the introduction. Um, I'll, I'll start by uh, apologizing uh, to all of you for having to postpone my talk um, a couple of weeks. And uh, a huge, huge thank you to, to Andrew for stepping in um, to take my place at, at such short notice, I gather. Uh, he managed to give an excellent talk with only about a day's notice. So um, thank you so much to Andrew for that. Um, and of course, thank you to all of you for, for being here now to listen to me. Um, very grateful to BirdLife for the invitation to speak. Um, and I, I'm sure that all the speakers say this, but um, just what, a, what an amazing thing that BirdLife is doing, um, putting together these conservation conversations. So it's, it's a really terrific initiative. Um, so congratulations to all of you. So um, what I'll do with, with this talk is, is I'm just going to give you basically a, a brief introduction to my research group, um, kind of generally, and then uh, I'll focus on climate warming. Um, and then I'll give an overview of my PhD on the Southern Yellow-Bald Hornbills. And yeah, basically, I, I hope that you enjoy it. Um, the, the first thing I'll point out is that, you know, this is, this is my PhD and I'm the one talking, but, um, you know, uh, Susie Cunningham and Andrew McKechnie uh, are my supervisors and they've just been the most uh, incredible supervisors and wonderful help over um, the entire course of my PhD. So um, I'll start by just saying thank you so much to them as well. Um, yeah, so my entire uh, research career has been as a member of the Hot Birds Research Project. Um, it's, it's an international research group that is focused primarily on understanding the biology of birds dealing with high temperatures and the threats that those birds are facing. Um, so naturally our focus means that we do a lot of our work in sort of very hot and arid zones. And over my sort of roughly nine years with the Hot Birds Research Project, um, my research has seen me, as Melissa said, work in the Karoo and Kalahari locally, um, in North America in the Sonoran Desert and in Australia uh, in the Gascoigne region. I, Melissa, you may have pronounced that better than me, I'm not actually sure. Uh, so I've, I've moved around a bit, been to, to some very cool places and uh, essentially deserts, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, are these, these uh, they can be very, very hot and dry um, and they're environments that, that sport basically very low primary productivity. Um, so there's just not a lot of food around in deserts. And generally, there are just these really extreme places for organisms to live. Um, so with the climate now rapidly changing, we need to know how um, 
for all the organisms really, but how the birds in these areas are dealing with their current environmental challenges um, so that we can understand how they might react to changes going forward. So uh, this talk, as I said, is basically an, an overview of my PhD. Uh, I, uh, as Melissa said, I started my PhD in 2018 when I was uh, young and fresh and enthusiastic. Um, I just finished my master's with, with Dr. Ben Smith at Nelson Mandela University in, in Port Elizabeth. Um, I looked uh, something like this. Um, and uh, after five uh, years of my PhD now, um, what I've done is I've, I've used some very sophisticated uh, AI rendering technology to get an image of my soul, um, which now looks something like this. Um, so uh, PhDs do really take their toll, um, but I, uh, I've, I've enjoyed it and it's been, uh, been an interesting five years. So uh, anyway, uh, before I, I get to the, the hornbills specifically, um, I'm just going to show you this, this graph. Um, and it essentially represents why the Hot Birds Research Project is doing the work that it does. Um, this graph has the uh, average daily maximum air temperature between October and March each year here on the y-axis. Um, and it's for three different weather stations out in the Kalahari Desert in Southern Africa. And these data are from uh, 1960 up until about 2021. Um, and basically what you can see <clears throat> is that it's, you know, recently over the last three decades or so, very clearly getting a lot hotter uh, out in the Kalahari. So what that means is that the organisms that are attempting to breed during and between uh, October and March each year, which for our international guests, uh, of course, is the austral spring and summer, um, those organisms are starting to face increasingly challenging breeding conditions. So this is true for a lot of seasonally hot arid areas around the world, basically. Um, so how this sort of now rapid change is affecting the organisms there has obviously become something of a major concern. So now onto my study species, um, the Southern yellow billed Hornbill, and uh, unfortunately the, the absolutely torrid relationship that they share uh, with that climate warming that I just showed you in that graph. So um, I'm sure, hopefully, at least uh, all of the locals will be very familiar with yellow billed Hornbills, um, especially if you spent any time uh, at a picnic site in Kruger, for those of you <laughs> logging in from the, that region, I'm sure there's probably a Southern Yellow Bull Hornbill at your window at the moment. Um, I, I studied Southern Yellow Bull Hornbills because they're pertinent to the study of the biological effects of climate change for a few reasons. Um, firstly, a, a very large part of their range, uh, including the field site where I studied them, which was a, a place called Kuruman River Reserve, um, is all in the Kalahari. So uh, uh, populations across a, a very large portion of their distribution are experiencing that really rapid climate warming that I just showed you in that, in that previous graph. Um, and then secondly, they forage sort of primarily on the ground and they breed uh, exclusively over the, the spring and through the summer, um, which basically those factors combine to make them really vulnerable to high temperatures and to the low resource availability you would typically associate with uh, very high temperatures and particularly with drought. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, uh, like most hornbill species, they breed fairly readily in nest boxes, um, which basically means that it's possible for us to look into some, some really neat questions um, regarding their reproductive ecology because as they breed, we have access to them inside of those nest boxes. So my field type was, as I say, the Kuruman River Reserve uh, in the Kalahari Desert of South Africa. Um, it's, it's an arid savanna woodland, uh, and the, the camel thorn trees that dominate the landscape um, are where hornbills would typically find uh, natural cavities to breed. But at the field site, there uh, have been about 30 to 50 nest boxes up since 2008, uh, when uh, the team sort of first started monitoring the hornbills there, and those nest boxes are there for the hornbills to use instead. So I studied uh, various aspects, basically, of the uh, reproduction of the hornbills as they bred in that system of nest boxes. So the aims of my PhD, and uh, you'll, you'll have to bear in mind here that um, you're getting a very abridged version of a 250 page long document um, that I've, I've tried to summarize into three points. Um, but basically, uh, first, we looked into the uh, what role uh, that resources, which is 
um, food and water. So yellow belt hornbills don't, um, they don't drink, they don't drink open water sources. So all of the water that they uh, require, they get from their diet. Um, so it's, I looked at what role the resources, which is food and water, play in affecting the relationships that these birds show between their reproductive ecology and then temperature. So basically, um, there's been this absolute wealth of excellent work done over the last sort of three decades or so um, that's established what effects high temperatures have on the physiology and behavior uh, and the reproduction of birds. But not a lot of them have looked specifically at how food and water fit into that picture. So um, that's sort of the first thing I wanted to look at. The second thing is, is based on the breeding data that we have from the study population of hornbills um, since 2008, when, when they, like I say, they first started being monitored. Um, I wanted to look at what their trends in breeding looked like over, over that period. Uh, and then lastly, uh, how all of that fits into um, the picture we have of how vulnerable birds are, especially those in arid zones, to climate change, basically. Um, so in, in the background of, of, these, uh, of these slides, you'll see some different views of my field site. Um, and I, I really encourage uh, any of you that, are, that haven't been out to the Kalahari's to, to please get out there. Um, it's, it's an absolutely stunning place. And uh, well, uh, probably go in the spring uh, or the autumn when the, the temperatures are bearable. Um, don't do what I did and spend six months at a time there over the hot period of the summer. Um, but yeah, absolutely stunning place. So please do go visit it if you ever get the chance. Uh, all right, so the first thing I'm going to do here is explain um, how my study system worked so that you understand um, basically how the hornbills breed and also how I collected my, my data so that sort of the rest of the things I'm going to show you all make sense. Um, and in this picture, you can actually see almost everything that you need to. Um, so the first thing, first things first, um, hornbills, um, th those, are, those are pretty essential, obviously. Um, here it's a, it's a male sitting on the left-hand side here uh, and a female uh, here provisioning to the chicks inside the nest box. Um, and uh, secondly, the nest box itself, a uh, very important feature. The hornbills, as I say, they breed in natural cavities in the wild, um, but at my study site, they use these nest boxes instead. Um, the nest box has a little removable um, lid on the top. So uh, it means that I can walk up to them. They're only about a meter and a half um, off the ground. So I can just walk up to them, take that lid off, and then I can access um, all of the nest contents um, to study them, which is great. Uh, and uh, oh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about the nest boxes in just a second. Then uh, the third thing here is the camera trap um, over here. And uh, that has wrapped up, it's wrapped up in some green shade cloth to try and protect it from the fairly warm Kalahari sun. Um, and uh, the camera traps were there to capture the behavior of the hornbills as they visited the nest uh, to provision. Um, then uh, fourth, you'll see in the bottom right hand corner here, there is a little brown box um, that has batteries in it that power a, a reader that I put on the nest box, um, which actually gathers the body temperature of the, of the hornbills every time they visit the nest and also the body temperature of the hornbills when they're inside. Uh, when they're inside the nest. So I inject a little, uh, it's called a passive integrated transponder. Uh, it's called a pit tag. And we put those in between the shoulder blades of, uh, of the birds, inject it just under the skin. And then that gives us the body temperature of the birds every time they uh, come into contact with that, with that reader. Um, and then the last thing here that this male hornbill is sitting on, on the left-hand side, is a little supplementary feeding station uh, not going to go into too much detail there. Um, it won't be too relevant to this talk, but um, uh, I put some superworms in there uh, for the hornbills to use to look at the effects of, uh, of resources. So uh, overall, basically of the hornbills, uh, the camera traps for behavior, the nest boxes so that I can check every day um, on the nest and access the birds inside, the readers here to get the body temperatures of the birds sitting, uh, visiting the uh, nest and the birds inside the nest, and then a little supplementary feeding station so that I could experimentally manipulate um, the resources available to the breeding pair. Um, good. So I, I hope that <laughs> hope that's making some sense. Um, all right. So uh, as I said, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about the nest boxes. Um, when uh, yellow-billed hornbills begin a breeding attempt, the 
female actually seals herself inside the nest cavity. Um, so you can see here, the entrance to the nest um, has actually been basically sealed up with a, sort of a combination of mud and feces by the female. And she leaves just this little opening um, for the male to pass in food and for her actually uh, to expel waste from the nest. Um, so uh, basically for the majority of the breeding attempt, the, uh, while the female has locked herself inside, the male does all of the provisioning. Um, so it's really, it, it's kind of this incredible system of trust basically. Um, and it has its risks and its rewards. So the risk is that if something happens to the male um, or the male is just not very good um, and he can't provision enough food, then the female has essentially a really high chance of, of dying um, because she's helplessly stuck inside. Uh, so, oh, I forgot to mention, when she's inside the nest, she actually molts all of her flight feathers. So after she starts the breeding attempt, she, um, she's not naked, but she has no flight feathers. She's stuck inside this nest. So if something happens to the male, she can't break out and fly away. Um, she's completely vulnerable to basically to dying um, if something happens to the male. But the rewards for this breeding system are very, very high. So uh, if I just hit play on this video, I, I hope you can get a sense um, of what this video is showing. But basically, uh, I hope you can see that this is, this is a very heavy hailstorm that one of the camera traps has caught. The, the camera trap is, is absolutely rocking. There's lots of lightning. The hail is um, absolutely pelting down. And you can just imagine that um, a normal sort of little cup nest um, would be at great risk of being destroyed or damaged in this kind of weather, um, but not so for the hornbills because they are safe inside um, their sealed up cavity. Uh, then, of course, the uh, other benefit is predation avoidance. So here you can see a common genet having a, a good old investigation um, of a nest, which he's not going to be able to get into um, because of that seal on the entrance. And if you, if you look closely, you can actually see the female uh, giving him a little jab uh, out of that little slit that they leave as an opening just to let him know that she's there. Um, and again, if, if this is a different kind of nest, he finds it, he finds a tasty meal. Not so with the hornbills um, because of this, this absolutely incredible nesting strategy. So uh, the last thing I, I have here is just um, one more picture uh, of the typical setup um, where you have the, the nest box, uh, camera trap feeder. And then this is uh, one of the, this is a different setup we used to get the body temperature um, readings of the hornbills inside the box and every time they visited. Um, you can see that these are solar panels. This setup is solar powered, um, which means that you don't have to visit the nest every single day to, to uh, change the batteries. Um, this setup weighed about 35 kgs. Um, and a lot of these nests were not very close to roads. So um, it just brings me such joy to look upon this setup and to think of all the times that I carried it to and from nests. Um, just really fun memories and research is always terrific. Um, anyway, uh, so I'll, I'll explain, um, the final thing I'll explain is how the Kalahari works. Um, for those of you that don't know, basically in the, in the context of um, the birds that are breeding there. So uh, my field site is one that goes through this, this major seasonal change um, from a very dry, cool winter where basically nothing seems to grow. You can see here the ground's pretty much bare. Um, and it goes through to a very hot uh, rainy season in the, in the spring and then through the summer. Um, and my last field season was actually absolutely extraordinary, um, where it went, it went from this, which is, which is kind of typical, um, to this, uh, where there were 250 millimeters of rain falling in a single afternoon uh, in the area, absolutely unbelievable rainfall for the season. And, um, and finally to this. Uh, which was a two meter deep river running right through the middle of my field site um, out in the Kalahari Desert. Um, so just to reiterate, this is what checking a nest normally looks like. Um, and uh, this here is um, not me. Uh, I, I, used, I use the term I a lot 
uh, in this talk, but um, it wasn't always just me. I had a lot of terrific assistants helping me uh, almost all of the time. This is Amy Hunter. Um, and what she's actually doing here is, is downloading data from a little uh, I button temperature logger that we put inside the nests to get the nest uh, temperature. Uh, and anyway, uh, this is what things typically look like when we check a nest. Um, and this was checking a nest in my final field season, um, which is where we had to swim out to check the nests uh, or this one specific nest. And uh, yeah, this is my terrific assistant, Justin Jacobs. Um, and uh, these chicks were high and dry, absolutely fine. Uh, but yeah, swimming out to check the nest was not what my normal field season looked like. Um, anyway, uh, the, the point is that um, there's seasonality and the, the seasonality creates a situation where the highest uh, abundance in the system, the highest resource abundance in the system coincides with the highest temperatures. So uh, basically the hornbills are constrained to breed uh, when it's rained because they need the food and resources that come with the rain. Um, but it creates a big problem, particularly for those males that are the only ones provisioning for a lot of the breeding attempt, um, which have to then provision and be active and forage during the hottest time of the year. So their provisioning and foraging effort has to be basically traded off against their own uh, thermoregulation. And then remember, in addition, you've got the females who are sealed inside the nest cavity with the eggs and the nestlings. So they're really vulnerable to high temperatures as well because they have no option to escape um, to escape the nest or to forage for themselves if they're feeling hungry or dehydrated. Um, so as I say, for my PhD, I had basically one um, normal season, let's call it normal. Um, that was in 2019, 2020, uh, which I call the hot and dry breeding season. And then this outrageous season with the flooding um, which I call the cool and wet breeding season. And, uh, and this is true. The reason that I, I call it the cool and wet breeding season is because um, my supervisor said that if I called it uh, the insane season where the highest amount of rain ever on record fell and flooded the entire Kalahari bisecting my field site with a literal river, uh, that wouldn't fit extremely well in my thesis. So just cool and wet breeding season um, seemed a little bit neater there. Uh, but basically, uh, keep in mind that there's the seasonality. And uh, I had one fairly normal breeding season and one cool, very wet breeding season. Um, so the normal season, when it rains, has that sort of influx of food and resources um, and water that comes with the rain. Um, but just remember that food is presumably still limiting. It is a desert. Um, and then the cool and wet breeding season has this absolute in, you know, surge in uh, resource availability to the, to the uh, hornbills as the Kalahari becomes this absolutely lush uh, jungle. Um, so just bear in mind those, those huge differences in the conditions and the food availability between those two breeding seasons. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll, I'll give you kind of a, a brief overview of my findings, uh, firstly to do with the male hornbills as they um, provisioned to, to the nest, then on the females when they were inside the nest, uh, and then finally uh, the chicks inside the nest. Um, and then I'll, I'll go through basically all of that ties into, um, into the big picture. Um, all right, so uh, for the males, as I've said, uh, I had these camera traps at the nests that uh, recorded the provisioning behavior of the males every time they visited the nest. Um, and in this video, uh, we have the male who, uh, was called Moby. Um, he's provisioning to a female uh, in box GA29. Uh, her name is Granny Weatherwax. And uh, you can see now that loop antennae uh, on, on the nest, which is getting the body temperature of Moby every time he arrives. And it's also getting the body temperature of Granny Weatherwax inside the nest um, all day when she's stuck in there. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll now get on to um, what I'm sure all of you have been waiting for, which is a few graphs. Um, but uh, I love graphs. I, I hope all of you do too. Uh, anyway, um, this, is, this is a graph of the uh, number of times per day that a male provisioned uh, to a nest. And uh, that's on the y-axis. 
And this is as a function of the maximum air temperature on that given day uh, on the x-axis. And you can see that this is uh, these data are for uh, the cool and wet season, which is sort of uh, the uh, gray dark dashed line here, and then for that hot and dry season, uh, which is the solid black line. Um, so what you can see here, firstly, is that there's this quite quite a big seasonal difference, um, and uh, the cool and wet season, which you know corresponds to again that huge influx. Uh, in food in the environment uh, has allowed the males to provision uh, a lot more across all of the air temperatures. Uh, then you can see that in both of the field seasons, uh, the rates of provisioning declines quite a lot with increasing temperatures. Um, so basically this graph is showing you two, two things. Um, firstly, that the cool and wet breeding season uh, with its increased food allowed the males to get a lot more food um, to the females and chicks inside of the nest. And then secondly, that temperature does have a limiting effect on how much the males can provision. As it gets hotter, they can provision less and less. Um, so there are some effects of resources here, um, but also negative effects of high temperatures, regardless of those resources. Um, this one below here is actually called Mr. Pattinson um, because you know I get to name things after myself, why not? Um, all right. Uh, then this graph is uh, the pro provisioning body temperature, the body temperature of a male every time it provisioned to the nest. Um, this is now as a function uh, of the air temperature at the time that that bird visited the nest um, on the x-axis here. And uh, again, the reader picking up the, the body temperature of the bird every time it visits the nest because of that little tag uh, between its shoulder blades. So what you can see here is that the body temperature of the males um, increases slightly at, uh, at these relatively moderate air temperatures, kind of between 10 and 30 degrees Celsius. Um, but actually it's, it's fairly stable. And, uh, but when you get to very high temperatures, uh, you know, well above 30, then the male's body temperature starts to really uh, increase very, very rapidly with increasing temperatures. Um, so this is actually what we, we call facultative hypothermia, um, which is basically uh, when the birds allow their body temperature to increase. Um, so basically what you can see here is that temperature has a really strong effect on how the males regulate their, their body temperature. Um, and if you um, uh, imagine this line sort of continuing along this, this trajectory, you can, you can see that as air temperatures are increasing, the body temperatures are gonna to have to go further and further up. Um, and eventually that body temperature is gonna to get to 45 degrees Celsius. And above that birds are risking um, a real, real uh, high risk of basically of lethal um, heat exposure. So at some point there'll be an air temperature at which the birds basically have to stop provisioning, have to stop being active. Um, so just a really interesting relationship we see here between um, the body temperature of a wild bird and its, and its provisioning behavior. All right, uh, onto the females. So for the females, I, I collected data uh, by visiting the nests every single day to check uh, on what was happening inside them basically. So I was gathering data on when the female sealed herself uh, inside the nest. Um, you can see a female on the left-hand side here staring up at me. Uh, as I just slide my phone underneath that lid on the nest box and take a photo of the uh, of the nest's contents. Um, and then uh, I was gathering data as well on when the female molt uh, all of her flight feathers when she lays her eggs. Um, in this photo in the in the top middle here, you can see a female actually surrounded by all of her wing and tail feathers as she's molted them all off and this, she's got a few eggs with her. Um, and uh, then I also gather data on uh, uh, how many eggs she lays, uh, when those eggs hatch, um, or in fact, when they fail to hatch, um, which is because of the females eaten them. Um, female wombles are pretty scary. They cannibalize their own eggs and, and sometimes the chicks actually. Um, so uh, I would record disappearances of the eggs and chicks, which is cannibalism. Um, and uh, yeah, then you can see on the uh, right hand side here, you can see a, a, a picture of me injecting that little uh, pit tag into the underneath the skin so that I can record body temperatures. Um, and then the last thing I would also collect data on is um, the morphometrics of the birds. So I would measure their tail feathers as they 
uh, as they regrew after they had been molted. Um, and I would do all of this um, basically once a week. Uh, all right, so the main findings here. Um, in the top panel, you can see the, the probability of an egg hatching, uh, where uh, one is hatching and zero is getting eaten. Um, and then in the bottom panel is the probability of a chick, uh, once it's hatched, um, fledging. So one here is a chick fledging, zero is getting eaten. Um, so what you'll immediately see here, oh, and of course, this is uh, uh, as a function of the breeding season. So again, that hot and dry breeding season on the left, uh, cool and wet breeding season on the right. So what you can immediately see um, is that the chance of hatching uh, and the chance of fledging are much, much higher in that cool and wet breeding season. So uh, this likely shows that the females in the cool and wet breeding season uh, are getting a whole lot more food, or at least they're getting much better food, much better quality food um, from those males that are provisioning to them more. Um, and as a result, they don't have to prioritize their own self-maintenance over their investment in reproduction. So essentially, they don't have to eat their own eggs and chicks. Um, they, they've got enough food to uh, you know, provide for themselves and for, uh, for their chicks. So just what you can see here essentially is this really strong effect of the resource availability or resource quality in the environment and how that affects their breeding success. Then <clears throat> some super interesting findings um, to do with the female's body temperature. So in the graph on your left-hand side here, you have the body temperature of the females inside the nest when they're incubating. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you have the body temperature of the females when they no longer have any eggs with them and they're, they're just with their chicks. Um, and uh, both, of these are, both of these graphs are as a function of the temperature inside the nest um, being logged by that little air button we put inside. Uh, and then the last thing here is, is there's this, this dotted line uh, here at 41 degrees Celsius. Um, and basically that's significant because above 41 degrees Celsius, an egg um, runs quite a high risk of basically of mortality. Um, so uh, what, what you're seeing here essentially is that the females change how they regulate their body temperature um, based on whether they're incubating or not. Um, so when they're incubating, they manage to keep their body temperature down to keep the eggs cool um, and make sure the eggs don't overheat because obviously we're in a desert here and you can see the air temperatures are getting um, really, really high, you know, uh, well above 45 in some instances. So, uh, and then when the, chicks, uh, when the chicks hatch and there's no more eggs, then the females show this facultative hypothermia or at least more pronounced um, and allowing their body temperatures to rise much higher. So yeah, just this amazing um, phenomenon, I think, uh, that the females change how they regulate their body temperature depending on whether they've got, uh, depending on whether they've got eggs or not. So um, what, I've got, what I've got here, um, just a quick video of, of a male um, just not understanding why his female is not accepting the food that he's worked so hard to bring her. Um, and she's in the process of trying to break out of the nest. Um, so she's been stuck in there for about two months inside with the, with the eggs and with the chicks. Um, and now she's trying to break out of this, this tiny little entrance to the cavity. Um, and I, I just wanted to show you this because I think it's extremely awkward and um, also terrific. Um, all right, now uh, onto the chicks. So uh, similar thing for them, once per week I measured their uh, their weights and I took measurements on their feathers and their bone growth as they developed. Um, and you can see here, if anyone who's never seen uh, a hornball chick, that they start out um, as absolutely hideous. Um, and then uh, as they grow, they, uh, they manage to, to stay completely hideous, uh, although they do get bigger. Um, and then eventually they turn into these <laughs> Awkward, um, but really majestic, beautiful blue-eyed uh, birds that we that we know and love. Um, so yeah, basically taking all of these measurements on them once per week. So all right, uh, what I have here is the average length of the tarsal, the chick's tarsal bones, um, the bones in their legs slash feet, um, and 
uh, that's on the y-axis. That's the, the average length of the tarsal bones when the chicks fledge. Uh, and then this is as a, uh, as a function of the breeding season difference, hot and dry on the left and cool and wet uh, on the right. So a familiar pattern here, basically, um, the higher food abundance or quality in the cool and wet season correlates to a much longer tarsus uh, by the time the chicks fledge. And uh, basically it shows that this, this change in resources leads to improved growth um, and that can have really significant benefits for these chicks down the line if, you know, if being better developed, if being larger, um, allows you to survive better or even to breed better later in life. Uh, and then uh, here you have, again, the same thing, um, that tarsus uh, length at the time that the chick fledges on the y-axis, but this time it's as a function of the um, average maximum air temperature or nest temperature during the time that the chicks grew, basically. Um, and you can see here that the uh, higher the temperature in the nest, the smaller the, uh, the chicks are, basically the, the, less their bones, the less their bones grow. Um, so this is showing a negative effect of, of high temperatures on the chicks' growth. And of course, you, know, you also remember that um, the increasing temperatures reduce the, the amount of food that the uh, males provision to the nest. So here we're sort of getting an indication that the chicks are paying a, a high price for that reduction um, in provisioning, in provisioning uh, effort. Uh, and then of course, also there's just the fact that high temperatures are, are um, costly directly to the chicks um, because they might have to invest more in, you know, in, in thermoregulation and less in growth. So uh, here is uh, now a video of a parent now trying to provision to a chick uh, as that chick tries, tries its hardest to break out of a nest when it's ready to fledge. Um, and again, the parent very confused that the chick is not accepting its lovely delicious item. Um, and I yeah, just wanted to show you this because uh, after about three months, the chicks themselves also uh, break the seal on the nest and then work very hard to get out and fledge successfully. Uh, all right, finally, uh, I did promise I would bring all of this into a into a big picture for you. Um, so what I'll finish with is showing you the long term uh, breeding data we have from this population of hornballs out in the Kalahari. So these two graphs uh, show uh, data from the breeding of my study population of hornballs um, starting in 2008 when we first started monitoring them. Uh, that's down here on the x axis uh, through to the end of 2019, and uh, each one of these points represents an entire breeding season. So you, you're seeing uh, 10 years worth of data here. Um, and in the top panel, you have the percentage of nest boxes that were used at the field site. Uh, and in the bottom panel, you have the number of attempts which were successful um, out of those that attempted to breed. Uh, success being managing to fledge at least one chick, um, basically. And uh, what you can clearly see uh, is that there's been a steady collapse in the breeding success of this population of hornballs, um, which if, if you can cast your mind back to the very first graph is uh, sort of negatively correlated with that increase in temperatures um, that, I, that I did show you. So um, basically there's this collapse in the breeding performance of the hornballs over that decade period that we monitored them. Um, and it correlates to that increase in temperatures. So now of course, you know, correlation is not causation, so we need to go and investigate um, a little bit more about into what is actually causing that trend. So uh, here I have the percentage of attempts uh, during that decade period that were successful. Um, again, success basically is, is managing to fledge at least one chick successfully. Um, and uh, this is as a, a function of the occurrence or absence of drought uh, over the course of the breeding season. And from this graph, you can, you can clearly see that rainfall is just this really strong driver uh, of success with high rainfall during the breeding season uh, uh, correlating to much higher probability of breeding success. So as I pointed out, um, rainfall in the Kalahari, it, it drives primary productivity. Um, it it uh, is responsible for energy available to, available to the entire trophic cascade. And uh, this relationship between rainfall and success then obviously makes so much sense, right? So, uh, 
um, the more rainfall there is, the more food there is for the hornbills, and uh, the greater their chance basically of, of breeding successfully. Um, <clears throat> so I've got a quick video here of now a, a male provisioning to the nest <laughs> after he's clearly gotten absolutely soaked um, in a rainfall event. So he's, you know, he's sopping wet um, and presumably very uncomfortable. Um, but it's it's just a really good example of how he, he has all this lush vegetation uh, around him. And this is in the Kalahari Desert. So uh, he's been able to find this, this beautiful big moth to provision. And those moths or those kind of food are probably likely around in very good numbers because of the rain. Um, and you'll remember those, those first set of results for the males um, showing that they can increase their, their provisioning effort when there's all of this food around. So this just gives you a, a visual um, of just how striking that effect is. Um, uh, but also remember that the, the higher resources available in the system mean more food for the females um, and the chicks as well. So, so it means that the eggs and nestlings don't look quite as tasty to the female. Um, so you have reduced cannibalism as well, likely. Uh, all right, now, um, what you see here is a graph of the, uh, oop, uh, is a graph of the probability of a nesting attempt um, managing again to successfully fledge one chick where, where one is success and zero is a failure. Um, and uh, this is as a function of, okay, this is a little bit complicated. Uh, this is as a function of the maximum air temperature um, being above the threshold temperature where the male hornballs show a 50% likelihood of engaging in panting uh, heat dissipation behavior. So, so basically what you have on the x-axis here is the um, percentage of days where the air temperature is causing really significant heat stress to the provisioning male parent. Um, and this is for, uh, for non-drought years, which is this uh, solid black line, and for drought years, which is this red, uh, this red dashed line. So essentially, you can see that uh, drought years cause basically near ubiquitous failure, um, regardless of the air temperature during the attempt. Um, and this reiterates that, that really strong dependency on rainfall and resources that come with the rain. Um, but then you can see that in non-drought years, there's this really strong effect of temperature. Um, where high temperatures during the breeding attempt really drastically reduce the probability of an attempt um, being successful. So remember the, the males at high temperatures are provisioning less, the chicks aren't growing as well, um, less food going to the nest means poorer chicks and you know, potentially more cannibalism by these hungry and dehydrated females who are stuck inside the nest and ultimately that all leads to increased failure. Um, and Really importantly, what you'll see here is that above about 72% of days during the attempt, which are above this, this basically heat stress threshold, um, and this corresponds to an air temperature of about 35.7 degrees Celsius, um, there's, not, there's not a single successful attempt in drought or non-drought years. There, is no, there are no dots um, at this end of the graph. So... <clears throat> Uh, a paper by uh, Shannon Conradi, uh, a colleague of mine in the Hot Birds Research Project and a bunch of her colleagues, uh, published a couple of years ago now, but it, it showed that the average um, summer maximum air temperature is going to approach this threshold of 35.7 degrees Celsius, at which we see not a single successful breeding attempt, okay, it's going to approach that threshold by 2080 across almost the entire Hornbills range. So, while hornbills uh, or southern elbow hornbills are common across a lot of southern Africa at the moment, they're such a household bird, by the turn of the century, um, they could be suffering really widespread um, breeding failure and, and, and really severe challenges to their persistence. Um, and all of these uh, last few findings, this kind of big picture, long-term stuff, uh, we, we, we've published it. Um, in, in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution. So anyone that is interested, please do go read up uh, on that paper. It's openly accessible um, if you're interested in more details there. Uh, all right, summing up, um, there's a climate crisis. Uh, you saw it in that very first graph. Temperatures are increasing super rapidly out in the Kalahari, um, the same as they are kind of worldwide. And from the data we have so far, it seems like um, the, the sort of the low resources 
the low resources available during drought really negatively affect the reproduction of the hornbills. Um, but basically that, that crash that we see in the hornbills over that decade that we monitored them um, is probably because of those increasing temperatures um, and the, the severe negative effects that, that high temperatures have uh, on the hornbills. So um, essentially overall, my PhD has shown that high temperatures and low resources are, are both bad, um, particularly for the males and for the chicks. And then low resources are, are especially terrible for, uh, for the females and, uh, and for their breeding success overall. So we know that there are these unavoidable negative effects of high temperatures on, on the physiology and the behavior and the reproduction of, of arid zone birds. And we're seeing um, all of those uh, sort of um, factors combine to um, cause a, a drastic reproductive failure in the hornbills, or at least my population of hornbills out in the Kalahari. So based on the, the sort of dramatic negative effects of high temperatures um, on breeding success, and, uh, and in combination with that rapid rate of warming, we can essentially predict that the hornbills are going to start seeing um, near complete breeding failure across a lot of the hottest parts of their range, um, e even within, within the next decade. Um, and when you combine that with the fact that the hornbills only um, really seem to live to be about 10 years old in the wild, at least that's what we uh, managed to gather from our field site, um, you, you get to this ultimate prediction, basically, that we're going to start seeing southern yellowbill hornbills becoming locally extinct um, in the hottest parts of their range with, within the next two or, or three decades. Um, so really, just around the corner. Um, and yeah, I mean, this, you know, this talk is specific to yellowbill hornbills, um, but it's worth pointing out that this is probably um, indicative of something that's going on with a lot of aridone species that are constrained to breed at the hottest time of the year um, in response to rainfall and that big increase in resources that comes with the rain. So, uh, like I said, please go to the Kalahari as soon as possible because um, it's not gonna be the same for too long. Absolutely beautiful place, but um, yeah, it is, uh, it is unfortunately under, under threat. Um, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but uh, Oh, man, that has rushed by. Uh, any, any, anyway, um, all that really remains is for me to apologize for the grim ending. Uh, um, and uh, very sorry about that. But um, thank you so much to all of you for attending. Um, it is such a privilege to present at BirdLife's Conservation Conversations. Um, thank you so much, BirdLife, for inviting me to speak. And um, you know, thanks again to my supervisors, to, to all of the people that have worked with me over all this time. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm always happy to answer questions and you know, all feel free to follow up with me in various other places after the talk. But um, yeah, anyway, thanks, thanks so much. Nick, well done. That was a fantastic talk, albeit rather sobering. And unfortunately, we have to be pragmatic. There is no way of sugarcoating what is coming. So thank you for sharing such a beautiful presentation and giving us a lot of food for thought. Climate change is real. And I think your study is one of many that is really demonstrating the consequences of, of what awaits us. And I think um, BirdLife as a, an organization has been always looking at ways to try and keep common birds common. And your study really highlights how important it is to keep tabs on our common birds. So thank you, Nick, and, and a huge well done. They are many questions waiting for you in the in the question box. So I'm gonna slowly start unpacking them. But uh, I think we'll start with this one to kick us off. And um, there's been a lot of questions regarding your, your nest boxes. And did you look at any of the hornbills utilizing any of your natural nest boxes or natural nests in relation to the, the nest boxes or just the nest box birds? Yeah, um, so uh, to everyone with that question, um, you know, well, uh, thank you very much. It's always a, it's a good question. Uh, good, good job for noticing. Um, no, we we uh, we did not look at uh, at any any basically, or I didn't look at any data um, on birds breeding in natural cavities. The 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 main problem um, with basically with the hornbills is that they they seal the nest entrance. Um, so you you can't access um, you can't access the birds when they're inside the nest. So you can't you can't get all sorts of the most important 
um, breeding information. You can't get, you know, how many eggs they lay, when, uh, when they're laying everything, when the eggs, when the eggs are being eaten, or um, when they hatching. You know, you can't get any of that. Um, what, any of the most important breeding information. So um, studying them in their natural cavities is is extremely difficult. Um, so no, unfortunately, not all of this is all of these data are from birds breeding in nest boxes. And yeah, and I'll you know obviously that is a it is a disclaimer. This this is a an artificial environment in that way. Um, and uh, yeah, we we can't be one hundred percent sure that this is this is exactly what's going to be happening to birds in their natural setting breeding in, in natural cavities, but um, yeah, it's it's probably at least a decent indication. Absolutely, and Nick, I'm, I'm not sure if you were the one placing the nest boxes given how far back the study goes, but is there any indication, and this is from Penny Abbott, whether the birds tend to choose this the shady side of trees for their breeding holes or, or the placement of your nest boxes? So, that's, you know, it's a, it's a super interesting concept and a few people have tried to look at this um, in a few different species. Some species seem to show preference um, for like one side or another of trees or Sahara cactuses in the Sonoran, um, you know, for, for their cavities where they breed. Um, I am not aware that anyone has tried to look at that in the hornbills. Um, and I, all I can say is that anecdotally, um, over the course of, of, of Tanya van der Fens PhD before me, um, she did a terrific bunch of work on this population of hornbills. Um, and during my, during my time, I, I would say that I think the hornbills just take what they can get. Um, natural cavities are quite rare. And, um, you know, they, when they find a suitable, I mean, finding a hole, a cavity in a tree that can accommodate a, a hornbill and all of its chicks and everything is, is just not common. And I, I don't think they can be particularly picky about it, unfortunately. Absolutely. And uh, I see um, Shashi is asking um, how the females go about isolating and protecting themselves in their natural habitat. You mentioned how this, the females will seal themselves into the, the man-made nest boxes. This is something that they show naturally in the wild as well. Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. Um, uh, they, uh, they typically, you know, they'll pick, they'll pick a, a natural cavity that has a similar um, nest entrance. So we actually designed the boxes, um, the diameter and specifications of the entrance to the nest box based on natural cavities that the, the hornbills um, select if they can find them. So um, yeah, they, they, they find a natural cavity with this sort of like 60 millimeter wide entrance and then they, they seal that up. Yeah. Brilliant. It's such a, a fascinating nesting strategy that these birds display where you've got the, the female sort of sealed up and molting all of her feathers helpless in the hole and relying on the male. Do you see a similar kind of breeding strategy in any other species of birds around the world? Um, sure. Uh, there's probably a few people in the audience that can answer that a heck of a lot better <laughs> than me. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, you know, a, 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 it's it's a bit of a mixed bag. I think um, you know a lot of species show dual parenting with with um, with provisioning efforts and behavior. Um, I think uh, I think as far as 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 far as the rest of the species go, this is fairly unusual. Um, just just in terms of the fact that the female um, not only doesn't provision for the first two months of the breeding attempt, but also is is her survival is completely reliant on the male during that time. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm not sure how many other species show a similar sort of uh, breeding setup. Um, and I'm sure there's a few people in the audience that are dying to answer that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's fairly unusual, at least. Absolutely. Uh, feel free to drop your comments in the chat box if anyone does know. I certainly don't know of any other uh, groups of birds showing such a, a strange strategy, but absolutely incredible. There we go, Lisa. Thank you. Hornbills are the only species <laughs> in the world that seal their nests. Clever birds. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> but um, one can't really talk about cannibalism and not not raise this afterwards. And I'm sure there were a few um, pill clutching moments through your talk, hearing what these these birds are capable of to survive. Um, Melissa Preston's put a question here asking, if a mother happens to eat her chicks or her eggs, did you find that she would then leave the nest and would she eat all of them in one go or was it sort of a staggered uh, consumption? Um, yeah, so 
it's it's pretty scary and it's it's pretty grim um yeah they 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 cannibalize they cannibalize the young um so what the hornbills what the hornbills do is they um they lay their eggs asynchronously um so a lot of other birds will lay all of their eggs basically in one sitting um the hornbills lay eggs about every two days um and then those eggs hatch kind of in that sequence um so what what the hornbills often do is they'll lay sort of four to um, six eggs. Uh, and then depending on the conditions um, and how the breeding attempt is going and the pressure the females under, um, she'll eat the eggs in, uh, in order of the latest, uh, latest laid. So if she lays six, she'll eat the sixth one and then she'll eat the fifth one and then she'll eat the fourth one. Um, and she'll, she'll keep reducing the brood like that basically depending on how many um, chicks she she can uh, successfully raise um, so yeah no they they definitely do not eat all of them at once they only you know presumably only resort to this if if they really have to and they'll reduce the brood kind of incrementally as they go um, but yeah basically if it, and I had a ton of this during during my PhD but um, if if conditions are extremely tough they they just keep going until they've eaten them all um, and then when they have when they have done that, they essentially then just break out of the nest and abandon the breeding attempt altogether. Um, so uh, and it, it seems like there's sort of a body weight threshold for them to do that. They if they get down to be about so humbles are typically about 250, 240 grams, um, somewhere around there. And uh, if they get down below 200 and they start getting more towards like 190, 180, um, they, that, that's it for them. That, that's when they, that's when they need to get out of the nest. Um, so yeah, so they sort of cannibalize up, up until that point and then, and then that's when they go. Sure. Absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure probably not, a, not an easy decision for them to make if we can anthropomorphize the birds for a moment. But, um, you mentioned how the females are able to regulate their body temperatures, depending on whether they're incubating or they've got chicks on the nest. And Pia's asking, when you speak about regulating her body temperature, what exactly is the female doing to try and, and alleviate that heat? Um, yeah, so it, it, it depends on, the, uh, depends on the, the air temperature, but basically um, the, the females are, are panting. Um, they, uh, uh, what, what birds do if they can move? This is one of the amazing things about the females because they're stuck, stuck inside this nest box. Um, what a lot of birds do to dissipate heat is is through behavior. So they'll you know they'll move into cooler, shady areas, um, or they'll reduce their activity, or they'll um, actually what a lot of birds do if it gets really hot is they 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 burrow basically um, or go and they fully go underground to try and find cool areas and find um, that sort of thing. So uh, the, the females don't they don't have those sort of things available to them. So what they can do is is basically pant um, and they lose a lot of water doing that, um, which is part of what leads to this, this dehydration stress on them. Um, and we, we think that basically part of the reason, for instance, that they eat their eggs um, is because they're feeling really dehydrated and an egg has a lot of water in it. Um, so yeah, they basically all they can do is, is pant. And uh, I, there's, there's, I, Actually, a couple of cool videos on this um, from the camera traps. But the, the females sometimes put their beak out of the nest opening and pant, um, sort of trying to desperately get a little bit of outdoor air. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically all that's available to them is to sweat and pant. Yeah. Sure. Really, really tough conditions. Um, you mentioned that they molt all of their feathers. Um, how long does it take the female to regrow those feathers? Um, and does she then leave the nest after a certain point and assist with the provisioning of the chicks once those feathers have grown back? Yeah, um, I think I might have said they lose all of their feathers. That's very misleading. Uh, <laughs> they do not lose all of their feathers. They, they are not just naked. Um, they, they just molt all of their wing feathers and all of their tail feathers. Um, and uh, that leaves them obviously completely incapable of flight. Um, but yeah, so, so they do that essentially as they, as they lay their first egg, they've committed to the breeding attempt now and they molt all of their five feathers all in one go. Um, it's called catastrophic molt. Um, and uh, they, yeah, then they, they re start regrowing them um, while they're in the nest box. And it, it takes about a month and a half 
um, for them to get fight feathers that they that they can you know use again. Um, and uh, again, super fascinating system because most birds molting is really really expensive, um, and most birds. Uh, partition during the year they breed here and then they molt in a different time of year because they don't want to do two very energetically expensive things at the same time the hornbills do it at the same time it, it's it's incredible um but yeah basically it takes it takes about a month and a half and then um that sort of signal once their feathers have regrown um it signals to them now i can break out and yeah when they do they do start provisioning to the nest as well they they take up some of the parental duties Fantastic. I noticed in your, your provisioning rates graph that there was no provisioning above 40 degrees Celsius, but presumably in your very hot, dry season, the temperatures did go above 40 degrees Celsius. Were the birds actively stopping their, their provisioning over that temperature, or is that just a sort of data artifact? Um, no, that actually, I mean, the Kalahari can be really hot. Um, it's, you know, uh, but that I, I actually did not have uh, breeding yeah, breeding basically didn't didn't go over the air temperature didn't go over that um, while I was out there. Um, my first season, which I, I didn't I haven't actually mentioned in this talk really at all, but I, I had a first season um, where the hornbills didn't breed at all. Um, there, there was there was zero uh, zero breeding, and and the average daily uh, maximum air temperature over the course of an entire six month period was thirty nine. Um, so that season was extremely hot and basically the hornbills just didn't breed at all. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, you know, there, there are, um, there are going to be those thresholds on behavior, but, uh, in the seasons that I collected data for these, basically for the purposes of this presentation, there, there wasn't anything that extremely hot. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Presumably when, when temperatures are getting that hot, it's just, as you say, not, not worth it to even try. Yeah, um, exactly. You spoke a lot about Shannon Conradi's work and the sort of impacts of these higher temperatures in the longer term. We know we've got products like the Southern African Bird Atlas Project and some really nice long-term studies. Have you, in, in your experience, managed to look at some of the, the longer-term distributions of these birds since 2008? And, and are we seeing a, a movement away from the Western boundary of the, the distribution? Uh, yeah, I mean, what an amazing resource uh, Sabah is. It is just incredible. I cannot emphasize enough um, what, a, what an astonishing data set um, that, that is. Um, so thank you to everyone that Atlas says you are doing, you are doing terrific, terrific work and it is being um, used in some phenomenal, phenomenal science. So, so thank you. Um, but uh, yeah, I, personally, I haven't, I haven't looked too much into it. I think um, if anyone is interested, then please look up Shannon Conradi's work um, in, in this space. She's done this for Southern Africa. She's done it for Australia. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're doing absolutely astonishing stuff. But yeah, basically, as far as I'm aware, we, we are starting to see um, either range contract, contractions or we're seeing um, shifts in where we normally see things. Um, and it, it's not always, you know, it, it depends, you know, for some species, things getting hotter um, is a good thing. You know, so at, the, at the cold edge of where some species can occur now, they can occur further or more broadly or um, further north or further south or whatever it is. Um, so the, the movements are quite complex, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we are, we are starting to see changes. Absolutely, and Lisa's asked the question, can we consider hornbills as sentinels for other species? For example, do you think there are other bird species that might be more or less sensitive to the changes you've described in your study? Yeah, um, so that's, that's a, that is a, a excellent question. Um, that, is, that, is the, um, that is the crux of it. So, you know, we, we study, you can only study so much at one time um, often if you're going to look very in depth like uh like a lot of us do then you can only look at one species at a time kind of thing um and uh you know we hope that the findings for one species will be applicable to a range of others and kind of give us a good indication of what's going on for instance in the kalahari or in amongst that bird community um but yeah it is a little bit difficult to extrapolate to other to other species what I can tell you is that um, a lot of a lot of the negative effects of low resources and high temperatures have been demonstrated for species all over the world, and this is um, it's it's becoming something that's really now well established and a problem for every 
for all birds. And, and um, I don't know if there's been any, any conservation conversations talks on it, but um, we're even seeing effects of, of high temperatures on birds in like Arctic regions um, where temperatures get above, you know, 15 degrees Celsius and we're having birds uh, like keel over and heat stress. Um, so yeah, you know, we always, we want our species to be a model species that we can extrapolate to others, um, but, you know, do so with some caution, basically. Absolutely. Everything has uh, evolved into their niches and what is coming will uh, determine how those niches uh, take effect going forward. Mm -hmm. um, looping back to, to the molting question and after you described the, the females molt patterns so eloquently, um, we have questions about the males and when do they <laughs> happen to molt? <laughs> Not to leave the boys out. <laughs> um, yeah, um, no, so, so the males, um, they basically show a, a normal what the rest of birds do, they do that. Um, so, so they they don't molt um, during the breeding attempt, um, and uh, it's actually interesting. You can you can see at the start of the breeding attempt versus at the end, um, their their tail feathers especially get absolutely wrecked uh, over the course of the breeding attempt. Because especially uh, you know if they're landing on uh, natural trees with rough bark like camel thorn trees have, every time they land, the tail feathers you know rub up against the bark and. Um, and they forage mostly on the ground, so their tails always kind of um, in amongst bushes and things. So they, they, their feathers get really um, banged up basically over the course of, of the breeding attempt. Um, and then once, once the chicks fledge and the female fledges out of the nest and starts helping with provisioning um, and the breeding attempt ends, then they'll, they'll go through molt um, like, the rest, like the rest of birds. They do it when they're not breeding, unlike female yellow bull hornbills, which do it at the same time because they're awesome. Brilliant. And uh, I think we'll, we'll treat this next question as the, the final one, just given time. I don't want to keep everybody up, but I think you and I could keep uh, keep us up for a while still. There are many, many questions here, and I'll share those with you, Nick, if you want to respond to them. But this one's from Michael Potts. And I have to say, watching you guys wade out to that nest box was um, a jaw-dropping moment. Absolutely uh, amazing what scientists have to go through. And listening to you... Um, fondly remember carrying 35 kilograms of solar gear across the, the Kalahari brought back my fond memories of my PhD lugging 20 kilometer lycors up five meter trees. So yeah. <laughs> I think every yeah. every PhD has their moments, but um, yeah, commiserations and well done on, on persevering. But Michael wants to know, um, you obviously needed to, to put the nest boxes at a certain height potentially. Um, and did you find that sort of higher rather than lower nest boxes um, affected your study or were they all pretty standard? Um, and did you have to move any because of the flood? Um, so that that particular nest box um, was being actively used when when, <laughs> when the river arrived. So we, we rushed out and basically moved it a couple of meters up the tree um, so that it was still on the same tree and the parents knew still where to provision, um, we hoped. Uh, but we did have to move that one up uh, much higher up above the, the flood level. Um, fortunately, that was the only one we, we did have to move. Um, but yeah, no, basically all of, all of the nests, I um, built, in, built all of these nests and insulated them and, um, and then put them all in the same place on a tree, like a meter and a half off the ground, all facing the same direction. Um, so yeah, the, the nest boxes were kind of standardized. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I think, you know, like I say, when hornbills find a suitable cavity, they, they just they just go for it. So, um, you know, it would be super interesting to put up an absolute ton of nest boxes and see if there was any kind of consistent preference for um, which ones they chose and where they were or what their, um, you know, situation was. But um, uh, yeah, that'd be great to look at. But for me, it was just all the nest boxes were in the same place. and. It just made it easy for me to walk up and harass the hornbills. That's that's bad. I didn't. That sounds bad. Uh, I didn't harass them. They they uh, we studied them for science. Yeah. Well done, Nick. It's. Uh, I'm sure your study went through rigorous ethics application, so we have no <laughs> doubt that your your harassing was within uh, means of science. But uh, thank you from my side. Last question, because I didn't answer our trivia question. Do you happen to know how many hornbill species there are in South Africa? Sure, so I was really hoping you weren't going to throw that at me. <laughs> it's all good. Um, there are, in I, fact, I six of them. <laughs> six. Oh, excellent. There okay. you go. 
<laughs> so well done everybody if you if you guessed that right but um nick thank you that really was a phenomenal hour and a bit and i'll give you one last chance just to uh share any closing sentiments before i close up for the night um no i mean yeah thanks thanks so much melissa for hosting um and yeah again a privilege that this is your last one um, best of luck to you with your with your new job and, and thanks so much for everything you've done at BirdLife and with Conservation Conversations. I think you've been um, an absolute giant. So just for me to say well done to you and, uh, and yeah, and then thanks to everyone for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for those kind words, Nick. And uh, yep, I will be back in two weeks time for my final show as presenter. So uh, it was an absolute privilege to host you tonight, Nick, and what a fantastic one to end on. But um, do join us in two weeks time. We'll be walking down the, the halls of memory lane and remembering some really fun moments on the show. So come and join us in two weeks time. And uh, until then, keep your eyes on the skies, keep enjoying those birds, and I will see you all on the 27th of June. Good night, everybody, and thank you, Nick.